I'm Sarah from Lothian, and today I'm going to be talking to you about video tutorials. I'm going to be examining why you should be making them and how to make the very best ones you can. A tiny bit of an introduction about me first. I am an educator, I am a learning enthusiast, and I am extremely passionate about good customer service. I've spent the last 20-ish years teaching everyone from tiny tots to retirees. I've spent the last five years examining uh, educational video content and uh, educational video content on YouTube specifically, which is termed edutube and 19 years helping customers figure out things. I've worked in film and television, I'm a published author, and I run the educational YouTube channel Monster Thinks. I've also worked as a game designer, a web designer, a social media manager, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, the decisions people make and the expectations that they have. I created and I am the co-admin of the Australian and New Zealand educational YouTube content creators Facebook page. Just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, I have uh, done network uh, events at the last two VidCons on educational video and I presented last year on EduTube at the International Association of Internet Researchers conference up in Brisbane. And before the pandemic I was working on a PhD on educational video content. So that's me. Let's talk about you and your video tutorials. But before we get into the how, let's talk a little bit about the why. So a few years ago, I was working as a tutor at a university for teaching students. So, you know, students who want to grow up to be teachers. And I was trying to convince an older academic of the virtues of online learning, which they were sort of on board with, and the virtues of YouTube educational videos specifically, which they were very much not on board with. And due to the pandemic, I really hope they're more on board with it now. Anyway, I found this attitude really frustrating. So, uh, one night I was thinking about it and I thought, I'll talk to my Twitter followers about it. So I tweeted this. It reads, please, please, please retweet if you've ever watched a YouTube video specifically to learn something. I'm trying to prove to my supervisor that YouTube is super useful for learning things. Feel free to comment below and tell me what you've learned too. I'd love to know. And then I turned my phone off and I went to bed. And the next morning, I turned my phone back on and I went to go make coffee. But I was drawn back to my phone because it kept vibrating and vibrating and vibrating. Overnight, this tweet had had over 200 retweets and around the same number of, of replies. Wow, I thought, that's a bunch of people who's learned a bunch of stuff on YouTube. That's cool. Little did I know. Over the next month, it kept being retweeted and people kept commenting on it. The interactions on this tweet swamped my mentions. Uh, in fact, I missed a number of people commenting and tagging me. Sorry, that's my dog coughing. I kept missing people tagging me in other stuff because of the flood of interactions on this tweet. I don't know what the number is to officially name something a viral tweet, but I reckon this one has it. When I was writing this presentation in September, it had, ahem, 17,529 likes, 18,621 retweets, and 6,629 replies. In fact, even though I tweeted this over a year ago on September 4th, 2019, to get the stats for this, uh, I knew that I could just scroll down in my mentions because it was last retweeted on September 1st, 2020. Hang on. Nope, false alarm. But this isn't about the numbers of that tweet. It's about what those numbers mean. 18 and a half thousand people have retweeted it. And while not everyone who retweeted it is retweeting it to prove that they have learnt something from YouTube, the vast majority of them are. Six and a half thousand people have commented on it. And again, not everyone was telling me about what they had learned from YouTube, but almost everyone was. And I tried to keep up with all the replies. I really wanted to know what people have been learning from YouTube, but it, too much. Six and a half thousand people. It's too much. But there have been some really great ones that have stood out to me uh, that show who the people are who are learning from YouTube and what they're learning from YouTube. And I thought I'd share some of them with you. Are you kidding me? I've learned both useless and very useful shit in there. I love that people have learned such a wide range of things. My husband and I are on the elder front of baby boomers and use YouTube to repair, build, choose all manner of things indoors and out. Art, craft, apparel design and illustration, gardening, native plants, decorating, spirituality, everything. I love that older folks are also using YouTube to learn things. It's not just that idea that YouTube is only for the youth. My father has been a mechanic for 35 plus years. When I was home this week, he pulled up YouTube to see how to fix something on a vehicle he hadn't done before. 
So professionals are using YouTube for professional development or PD. This is the second year in a row I've set my class a challenge of learning something new from YouTube clips. I have kids knitting, doing front flips, playing recorder, planting a garden, painting, riding a unicycle, making balloon animals. It's epic! I love that teachers are setting their students to learn things on YouTube. I have learnt so much, I can't even begin. It's my occasional Yoda. Also Sherlock used YouTube to learn how to fold wedding napkins. Even fictional characters are learning things from YouTube. I have taught myself everything I know about Adobe Premiere and Adobe After Effects using YouTube videos, as well as a ton of new skills in Photoshop and much of my understanding of photography. Whose Photoshop YouTube videos do you recommend? I really love that it, it sort of became a momentary community where people were asking each other their favourite YouTube tutorial videos as well. I live in a large and vibrant community of people who sing and play traditional music. YouTube has videos of so many of the old songs and tunes. We learn the music and share those videos and we add our own music to be shared as well. I love that people are using it to learn and continue culture and traditions. Even YouTube retweeted it, which was kind of cool. And I think this reply sums up the whole argument. Tell your supervisor to come up with something that he, she can't find a YouTube how-to video for. There's even a phrase for all this learning. People refer to it as YouTube University. So as I said, I've been thinking about uh, educational YouTube videos for a good couple of years now. And sometime last year, I started noticing that people were using this phrase YouTube University. One of the first places I noticed it was Project Runway. So my favourite kind of reality TV shows are the things where people make stuff like Project Runway, uh, Bake Off, Sewing Bee and the sequined gloriousness that is RuPaul's Drag Race. This is in the latest season of Project Runway, uh, season 18, episode 2, and the designer Marquise Foster said this. But I'm a student of YouTube University, completely self-taught. Now, if it's not clear from just those screenshots and removed from the surrounding context of the show, Marquise is saying that he didn't go to any kind of design school and he learned how to design and sew clothes purely from YouTube. A few days later, I was watching The Great British Sewing Bee, season five, episode three, as a matter of fact. Juliet is a primary school teacher and she also learned her skills from YouTube. And here she was trying to figure out how to sew a fly in a pair of jeans. If I were doing this at home, I'd just switch on YouTube. YouTube it. And then this from the Great British Bake Off. Horrible doing the plaits in front of Paul Hollywood. It's because I'm using a Paul Hollywood technique that I looked up on YouTube. The fact that this idea shows up on reality television over and over again shows me that the idea of turning to YouTube to learn something is prevalent in the minds of Western society. The idea of YouTube University is so prevalent that it's even got its own merch. Look at the date of that tweet, 2015. Clearly I'm late to this party, but that's what makes me cool, right? I come from Melbourne and Melbourne has a huge culture of street art and around 2018, this started showing up on walls everywhere. The University of YouTube, this is to certify that Remy Evan was duly admitted to the degree of Bachelor of Everything General Knowledge in the University of YouTube on the 19th of February 2018. And YouTube itself is starting to embrace the idea that it is a vast library of educational videos as seen in this official YouTube ad. And while I know I'm talking a, quite a bit about YouTube, this can be absolutely widened out into online video in general. However, as an aside, have you thought about where you're going to upload your tutorial videos? Are you going to upload it just on your site? Or are you going to upload it to maybe YouTube where people are going to learn things anyway? In 2015, there was an article published that presented the findings of a number of studies done on online video learning. It showed that searches related to how to on YouTube was growing 70% year over year. And remember, this is 2015, this is five years ago. And in 2015, over a hundred million hours? Yeah, over 100 million hours of how-to videos had been watched on YouTube. They also noticed that the classification of how-to videos, uh, they pulled the data using uh, titles and tags and stuff. And so they may not have accounted for every how-to video actually on YouTube at the time. And the study also showed that 67% of millennials could find a video on anything they wanted to learn. 91% of smartphone users turn to smartphones when they are looking for ideas on how to do a task. And nearly one in three American millennials in 2015 had bought a product specifically after watching a video on YouTube. One in three bought a product. That's us. So in 2019, Pew Research put out a study of what people are going to YouTube for. 
51% of US adults who use YouTube say the site is very important when it comes to figuring out how to do things they haven't done before. And 19% say YouTube is very important when deciding whether to buy a particular product or not. 19%, that's one in five American adults who use YouTube, find it important when they're deciding whether to buy a product. And this graph is from 2019 and it's showing how Australian adults spend their time online. You can see that Google is red on the left or the right, depending which way this goes on your screen. And you can see that YouTube makes up 8% of um, time spent online, which is only eclipsed by Facebook. So YouTube is the second most uh, visited website for Australian adults last year. And before we get to the how, let's just take a tiny moment to look at the different kinds of learners. Not everyone learns the same way. Some people prefer visual learning. Some people prefer audio learning. Some people prefer to learn in groups and some people prefer to learn alone. So there are actually seven types of learners. Audio and musical learners, visual and spatial learners, verbal learners, logical and mathematical learners, physical or kinesthetic learners, kinesthetic means moving, social and interpersonal learners, and solitary and intrapersonal learners. Now looking at this handsome chart, how many styles of learning do you think video tutorials cover? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. I don't have any music, so... All right, I'll show you. Really, the argument shouldn't be, why should we make video tutorials? It should be, why haven't we made video tutorials already? Now I've convinced you that the video space is an important place to be and it's where your customers are going to look for information on your product. Let's talk about how to do this. Let me give you some tips on the best way to do this you can. Do some research. Look at a range of video tutorials and see what you like and what you don't like. And you don't have to stick to your industry. I've watched video tutorials on how to play computer games, on how to bake certain foods, on how to sew slippery shiny fabric, everything. Take note of the length of the video, the camera angles, the style of presentation, and the information actually being presented. Anything that can help you understand how you want your videos to look. Let me give you an example. My favorite video game is Dishonored. I love it. But there was this puzzle that I just couldn't get. So I googled how to do it and I found a video tutorial. Yay! I expected this tutorial video to be like 30 seconds. I expected it to start with a character standing in the room, going over to wherever the puzzle was, doing whatever they had to do to solve it and claiming the reward. It was not that. Instead, it was 10 minutes long. And it was the character blundering around the room, like looking under tables, opening cupboards. And you could almost hear the player thinking, is it here? No. no. How about here? Hmm, that's not it either. What if I try this? No. Okay, how about this? Oh, I tried that already. Girl, just show me the solution! I ended up fast forwarding to the end. And I'm not usually one to read the comments, but the first comment under this video was worst tutorial ever. And look, they weren't wrong. So what I learned from this video, apart from how to solve the puzzle, eventually, was my expectations. I wanted it to be short, sharp, to the point, show me what I needed to do and be done. So do that. When deciding on what to make videos about, look at your current help stats. By that I mean, what's the five things that customers write in about the most? What's the most visited help pages on your website? And how do these things correspond? i.e. if the second most uh, visited page on your website is about X and it's one of the top things that people write in about as well then they're not getting the information that they're looking for in a style that they can understand from the web page. So I work for Fastmail. We're an email company. We get queries from customers on both ends of the scale from the super basic stuff how do I make an account, how do I change my username to really super technical stuff that I can't properly describe to you because I don't have a handle on it. Yet. Yet. I'm learning. Some of our top requests are for really simple and basic things and for slightly technical things that are just a little above customer's experience level. Thinking about what your customers are having trouble with and the things they continually ask you for will help you decide what to make your videos about. 
It is awesome if you have the right equipment, right? But what's so ace about technology is you probably have the right equipment in your back pocket or on your desk. Mobile phones have amazing cameras and there's heaps of free video editing software out there on the net. Some offices do have camera equipment and if you can borrow that, awesome! But if not, you're still good to go. A well-lit spot, a phone, a laptop, and you're sorted. Research shows that people learn better from videos when there's a person's face in it, even if it's only for the first five seconds. Hi, I'm Sez, and today I'm going to show you how to... And you already know how it should sound. You probably already have style guides for your help pages and other forms of public communication. Keep in mind, though, that style guides can vary depending on what is being communicated, where it's being communicated, and from whom. Our marketing department has a different style guide to, say, our customer service department, who have a different style guide, again, to, say, our social media team. You probably want to be warm, friendly, and reassuring. You're a real person talking to real people. It's okay that you sound like that. The videos should be quick. People just want to know how to do the thing. I've watched tutorial videos for things like Pre Adobe Premiere, computer programs that are 20 minutes long. And I just want to know how to do that one thing. And unlike the game tutorial, I can't fast forward through it because it's mostly a screen recording and very little actually changes. So I couldn't recognize that, ah, that's the bit I need. 20 minutes of my life, I'm never gonna get back. Remember you're not making YouTube videos, you're not making TikTok videos, you're not making any of those cool, fun, super quick uh, social media videos. Your customer is coming to you for simple information laid out clearly. So do that. Whether I write a script or not is really about the kinds of video I'm making. Sometimes for educational videos, when I want to get all the points correct, or timelines, or there's a lot of dates, I want to be really clear with the information I'm giving, I will write a script. And then I have my laptop beside me, and I basically repeat it line by line from the laptop until I get it right. Hello, I'm Sarah from Lothian, and today I want to talk to you, what do I want to talk to you about? Video tutorials! Oh, come on, this is going great. Hi, I'm Sarah from... <laughs> oh, I'm out of practice at this. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Sarah from Lothian, and today I want to talk to you about video tutorials. I'm going to be examining how you should make them. Oh, no! No! I'm going to be examining why you should be making them. Hello. And it's a bit laborious that way, I have to say, but it means that I'm getting the correct information in the order that I want it. If the videos aren't quite as educational or don't need that real precision, I'll write dot points or even just wing it. I've learned that I'm a lot more engaging when I'm just talking off the top of my head and not desperately trying to remember the next line as I'm talking. I'm not an actor. But I also know that I've gotten way better at this from when I started through practice. Want to see a couple of seconds of one of the oldest videos I have? Uh, I'll try. All right, so. Um, so we've driven to Geelong today to check out the National Wool Museum, um, which I've never been to before and I know very little about, but I'm very interested in craft, obviously, so I wanted to come in and have a look. Awkward. But that's okay. I got better and you will too. At the start, you probably want to script your videos. You might need to run these scripts past people in the company to check you've got the information right, to check you've got the voice right. These videos can be a company-wide collaboration, especially at the start if your company is a little nervous about moving into this new territory. That's okay, we're all learning together. A title card is the thumbnail image that shows when your video isn't playing, like this. It can also be inserted for a little branding and show people they're watching the right video. However, it doesn't need to be very long and you certainly don't need a title sequence. I like watching Toy Galaxy. It's a mostly educational YouTube channel about the history of 80s and 90s toys. And I love it, but its title sequence is 25 seconds long. I mean, it's really pretty, but it's 25 seconds long. And once you start watching a couple of videos in a row, oh my God, it's so boring. So don't do that. A little music underneath like screen recordings or something is great. It helps to fill the space, but make sure it's not too loud. People are coming to you for your explanations, not a symphony. 
Also make sure you have the rights to the music. You can find royalty free music online or you might want to commission a local musician to make something for you. Commission a local musician. That's a good one. Commission a local musician. I like words. So I know I've been giving you text and images and lots of fun and throughout this video uh, while telling you not to do it in your videos, but I'm not a hypocrite. Uh, this is a conference presentation, so it's a different format to a tutorial video. So let me give you my first ever Fastmail tutorial right here, right now. Obviously, if it wasn't COVID times and we were in Melbourne, then I would be doing this in the office, but my front foyer is going to be an excellent substitute today. Fun fact. I've worked with this company for eight months, have not spent a day in the office. Remember when things were normal? Hmm. Hi, welcome to Fastmail. I'm Sez and today I'm going to show you how to sign up for an account with us. Open your browser and type in fastmail.com. You'll be taken to our site. Up in the top right, you can see a button marked Sign Up. Click on that. First, you'll need to enter your name. Then choose your email address. The system will tell you if this email address is available for you to use. If you see a little red message that says, sorry, this name has already been taken, please try another name. Here, you can choose which domain you'd like to have for your email address. Fastmail has a number of domains you can use, or you can choose to use a custom one of your own. Now put in a password. For security, it is important not to use a password you've used before. Now you'll need to agree to our terms of service. You can click here to open them up and read what they are. Now you're all set. Click on the 30 day free trial button to create your account. So that's how to sign up with us. Let us know what other video tutorials you might like to see, and as always, if you have any questions or concerns, please contact support. We're always here to help. So a couple of points to note here. I used language that was consistent with our site. I didn't say, let me show you how to join us, or let me show you how to make an account with us. I said, let me show you how to sign up because that reflects the button in the top corner. It was quick and to the point. No blundering around, no faffing about trying to open things. People are coming to you for expert advice about your product, so give it to them. There was some subtle branding, did you notice? I was wearing a fast metal t-shirt. If I was in the office, I might try and film next to a logo on the wall, but then I probably wouldn't have worn a fast metal t-shirt. Bit of branding is good, over branding is not so good. That tutorial was filmed on my phone and the screen record stuff was done on Zoom. It proves that you don't need expensive equipment to make these tutorials. Like professional cameras and stuff, they're all great, but if you don't have them, you can still make amazing tutorials. Be prepared to make some mistakes along the way. This is new territory for all of us. Writing help docs has been around for a long time and we've had centuries to perfect it, whereas home video is relatively new. You can absolutely do this. Find a quiet, well-lit corner of the office, set up a camera or a phone or your laptop and just record. It's that easy. All right, a couple of points to take away with you. Know your audience. Be clear on who you are delivering to and adapt your material to suit them, like age group, nationality, prior knowledge, expertise. What are your customers looking for and what do they need to know to use your product? Simplify your language and slow down. Avoid using idioms, mannerisms and phrases that only certain groups will understand. Sometimes good content and good content creators are unusable as resources because they talk too quickly for the audience and they use slang. We have offices in uh, Melbourne, in Philadelphia, and we have some remote workers in India as well. Um, and I have found that Australian slang, even though these guys have worked with Australians for you know up to 20 years, they're still not sure of things I'm talking about sometimes. My manager had to Google the term scuttlebutt yesterday. Use appropriate visual aids and demonstrations. Animations, diagrams, and live demonstration with voiceover can greatly cut down on the time it takes to explain a concept. Talking head videos are usually not the best way to teach. Research, prepare, script, and practice. 
Especially when starting out, trying to teach things off the top of your head can be convoluted and stressful. Things take longer and become more tangled. And frame your learning goals clearly and narrow the topics down into viewable chunks. So if you have six different things that your customer needs to know, make six different videos. Don't make one long video that they have to fast forward through. <laughs> so Sarah from really engaging presentation style thanks so much for um for for presenting like that and um for joining us here for the Q and A today um so we got we have actually had some really good questions come through thanks again folks for um pushing your questions through using that Q colon notation in uh the chat it's great it makes it really easy for it to collect them and thanks for Swatnell for sorting them out for me so it's um makes it easier for me to read them. So a couple of um, questions <clears throat> first that um, are sort of related. I'll ask them one at a time, but um, how do you actually make video tutorials stand out in Google search results? Do you do you know, have any insight in that? So that's a really interesting question because I haven't thought about that before. So I don't actually have any professional advice for that, but I wonder mm -hmm. if that's a question that you should take to Scott because he was looking at how to, um, maximize the stuff that you put out there so that Google can find it. So maybe that's like a collaboration between me and Scott. I don't know. Um, mm. But yeah, I'm not sure on that because I've only just entered this part of the research phase. So sorry that I can't help you with that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's easy enough to do it with text, isn't it? But you know, when you're actually looking at video and speech and stuff like that, it probably does complicate matters a little bit. I'd imagine it probably comes down to, as you say, what Scott was saying with metadata and stuff like that. Yeah, I think so. So like if you had, so um, on your help page, you have the video embedded there. I would think that it's part of the metadata of that help page that will turn up in Google results rather than, you know, just the video itself. Oh, that's interesting. So you think it might actually help to, to actually have the video embedded in situ on a page and then that yeah. surrounding text might actually help you to surface the videos more. Yeah, that, so that's what I'm planning for FastMail. Um, one of the reasons that I've been hired from FastMail, apart from my excellent customer service, is the um, tut video tutorials, right? Mm. And so that's what I'm planning to do is host them on YouTube so that people can find it on YouTube because people are going to YouTube anyway to learn stuff, but to embed them in our help pages. So if somebody goes, how do you sign up? There's the help page. Here is the explanation. And here is a video if you'd like to watch it um, step by step. So it's it's in two places too. Because if you look for fast mail on, on YouTube, there are a number of customers who have done reviews and some of them aren't as great as you'd hope. So you sort of want to be where people are and where people are already making content about your stuff to um, help skew the results <laughs> in favor of your of your uh, company or product or whatever. Where you actually want them to be, yeah. Not yeah. where, not where the, the internet tells them that you want them to be. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I guess, I wonder if um, something like transcriptions and stuff might actually help with, with visibility. Uh, yeah. of what do you think about trans transcriptions and videos and the value that they add? Do you mean transcriptions like here is the video and here is the script that we've put on the page? Or do you mean transcriptions like uh, subtitles on the video itself? Yeah, well, b probably a, a bit of six of one, oh. half a dozen of the other. Yeah, a bit of a mix. I think, uh, sorry, I think they're both really important because part of the reason that you'd be making a video tutorial is to make your product or whatever you're doing more accessible to people. And so then making your videos as accessible as possible is also really important. Um, I don't have co I don't have uh, closed captions on my YouTube videos, but only because I didn't I haven't had time to do it. Mm. But for the ones that I make for Fastmail, I will certainly be doing that because again, you want to give everybody the opportunity to engage with your product or your service or whatever it is the best way that you can. Yeah, for sure. Um, so um, I've, there's another theme of questions that uh, we've got here, which is um, it was related to transcriptions or um, and things like that. But I think another big one that people often struggle with is um, how to how what software do they need to use to, to edit the videos? Like if they were just perhaps starting out to perhaps wanting to level up in their video production, what sort yeah, of insight absolutely. do you have with that? 
So um, we have at home Adobe Premiere, but that's because um, my wife and I were like ex grapho graphic designers and all sorts of things. So we already had that. Mm. But um, for that vi for the video, I was looking around, and so I filmed the help video itself on my phone, um, and I was going to edit it in. Uh, is it Movie Maker that uh, is a free product with your Mac? Oh, I'm it Movie. Yeah. I moved, that's yeah. it. Um, and I could have edited it in that and it was um, would have been totally fine. The reason that I didn't was I ran out of time and I know how to use Premiere, so I didn't want to have to learn how to use iMovie just for this thing. But I think that there's so many free things out there that you can really just start right now. You know, like I've got my phone, I've got my laptop. It could be, it's yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you don't need huge amounts of really expensive equipment. You can just do it with whatever you've got now. Yeah. Okay. That's a that's a good. Result. So, in other words, don't be put off by thinking it has to be perfect. It just needs no. to be enough, right? Yeah. It just needs exactly right. And I think that um, the more professional and schmick, and you've got lights and cameras and stuff, um, that can be great. And it depends on how you your brand is. But having having enough. So having just enough light so that it doesn't look like you're filming in a dark room and the technology and stuff. Don't let the fact that you don't have what you think is the right technology stop you doing this thing. Mm, yeah. Just get in there and give it a go. Yeah, yeah. And what's, the, like, honestly, what's the worst that can happen? Somebody will write in going, oh, I'm not sure about your videos. And then you can decide whether to make them better or take it off. But, yeah. Some, somebody may write, worst video ever. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go, well, whatever, we just iterate on it, right? Yeah, like, so here's another thing that, so I'm also an artist, and one of the things that's really important to know is that not everyone is ever going to love your work, right? Whether mm. it's an artist, whether it's your customer service, whether it's your videos, whatever, there are always going to be some people who go, well, that's really shit, isn't it? And, like, <laughs> so it, it's just going to happen, right? So there's yeah. always some people who love it, and there is going to be some people who don't like it. Don't listen to those guys. The, it's the middle ground of the people who are just looking for help that is who you're trying to uh, aim at. Don't listen to the haters. See, I, right. I, I know the youth speak. So what? here's a really good question um, that I think probably you would have definitely experienced as well. What happens when things change in the thing that you're actually describing in your video? How do you manage the load of maintaining videos when the product changes and those sort of challenges? That's really interesting, actually, because we're uh, currently doing that for our help pages. So a couple of big things have changed in Fastmail, and so now we have to go back and rewrite the help pages. Um, and so what I would be doing is, because um, I haven't started making videos for Fastmail yet, I'm still in the research phase, mm. but what I would be doing, excuse me, is taking down that video because there's nothing more frustrating than trying to watch a video or trying to work through a help page to do a thing that those things aren't there anymore. So I would take it down and then um, just have, you'd have to make a new one. But also um, you can ex assess all the time how your videos are going. Like maybe you've made that video and you've when you take it down, only two people watched it. So is it worth now busting a gut to, to um, make a new one right now or is it better to focus on something that you haven't made a video about that people are desperately asking about all the time? That actually might flow into probably the last question that we have time mm -hmm. for, which is about metrics or feedback um, for videos. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, have you found that, um, how have you used metrics to make data-driven decisions like that? So it's actually really interesting because I got my first thumbs down on a video the other day on my YouTube channel. And I was thinking about the, the thumbs downness of things. And it's a really terrible system. Like, mm. so I'm not obsessed about, oh my God, why didn't they like it? But it doesn't tell me anything. Like, were, did they not like the script or were they unhappy with the, the camera angle or were they not interested in the topic or did they not like me? Like, uh, just a thumbs down is no, no use at all, right? Yeah. So I would be, um, yeah, I don't know that I would be using the, the, data metrics of the videos but as I said like I'd be looking at the pages our help pages the ones that are most accessed and the stuff that customers write in about all the time saying how do you do this how do you do this and how do you do this and those are the decisions that are those are the, that's the data that I would use in deciding what videos to make and what videos to make next right yeah that actually does make a lot of sense mm. um 
Okay, I think it's we're getting close towards that 10 minute mark and we always have to make sure we have time for reset for the, the next yep. session. So that that's totally fine. I'm on Twitter. You can ask me questions on Twitter as well, or you can ask me questions here in the conference because I'm here for the next two days. Awesome. That's, we had to catch up in um, the hallway hallway tracks like we were doing <laughs> this morning, which was really fun. <laughs> And I promise to turn on my video and my mic this time. <laughs> not, to, not to be the um, the unintentional lurker. <laughs> lurker. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's awesome. All right. Well, look, thanks again um, for coming in uh, and jumping into the Q&A session. It's been great.